So next we're gonna move on and look over at the, at the case of the pendulum. And I've purposefully left some notes about uh, movement of a mass on a spring up here because I want you to be able to see the similarities between the, the two systems. Um, so much like we did with the mass on the spring to start to analyze how this is gonna move, um, we wanna put the forces down that are acting on the object um, that's gonna swing back and forth. So I'm gonna fixate on it while it's on this, in this position. Um, what's gonna happen is you'll have gravity pulling straight down like this. So I'm gonna uh, call the force of gravity mg. Something that's gonna help us later is I'm gonna also indicate this angle between um, that force and the, the line of the string. Um, and then also pulling up this way is gonna be the tension in the string. So what we did with the mass on the spring was we started with F equals MA. Um, it's possible to do that in a way with this, but what I'm gonna to choose to do instead is the rotational uh, version of F equals MA. And so what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna look at torque equals I alpha. So instead of force equals mass times acceleration, I'm gonna kind of do like rotational force or torque equals rotational mass or moment of inertia um, times, well, rotational acceleration or angular acceleration, um, which is alpha. So some of the torques is I alpha. Well, so what we wanna do is look at how much torque there is on the system. Uh, here's the axis. And so torque, we wanna have uh, the effective force times the distance. Oh, it looks like I better give this string a length. Let's call it L. So the string's gonna have length L. For torque, right, what we want is only the component of force that's perpendicular to the string, right? So we have kind of like a, a component of mg that would be this way, that I could call like mg parallel. That's not our guy, that's not gonna make um, uh, any torque. We want the part that goes this way, which would be like the perpendicular part of mg, right? So that would be the part, the component that's this way, which you can see that's kind of opposite the angle we know, so it would be like mg sine theta. Okay, so the effective force is gonna be mg sine theta. Um, so on the left-hand side here, we'll go mg sine theta for the effective force um, times the length, because you need force times distance. And then the other thing we need to remember here is we wanna put a negative sign because we want the, as we increase theta, we want the force to tend to bring it back towards smaller angles. If we neglected the negative sign, that would mean that the, the greater the angle we pulled to, the more it would wanna go away. So the thing would just fly away. That's kind of like with the mass on the spring, um, you wanna have the force be negative kx because you, as x gets bigger, you want there to be more incentive for it to come back. Um, just like there is with the, with the pendulum here. So here's the torque, uh, force times distance um, equals I alpha. Well, I is gonna be the moment of inertia of a point mass, uh, just m, m r squared or m times distance squared. So that's m l squared. Right. And then times alpha. Now, I could put, and so what alpha is, um, I could write alpha, which is the angular acceleration, but then what would happen is I would have a theta, which is changing in time, and a variable alpha, which is changing in time. Um, so kind of too many variables, too many things changing at once. So what I would rather do is write it in terms of just one variable. Well, so alpha, right, is the angular acceleration, so it's the second derivative of theta. Um, so sorry, the writing's getting small here. I'm gonna soon get out of this corner. Uh, d squared theta dt squared. Right. Um, so again, you can kind of see we were at the same point here with uh, mass on the spring. We had minus kx is m d squared x dt squared. Um, here we have a pretty similar thing getting, getting built up. So what I'm going to do is exactly what I did before, which is to solve for the, the second derivative of the uh, position variable, basically. The second derivative of the angle. Um, so let's solve for that. Uh, looks like one of the lengths um, goes away here. Uh, looks like the mass goes away. So that's key. That's something that's different from the um, mass on the spring. Here the motion was dependent on the mass. Uh, with the pendulum, the motion is, is not going to be dependent on the, on the point mass that you put here. Um, so that's going to cancel out. And so uh, just rearranging that a bit, it looks like we get d squared. As a matter of fact, I'm going to write it. I'm gonna write it over here so it looks just like what we had at this stage uh, last time with the mass in the spring. d squared theta by dt squared 
equals, you're going to get minus g over l sine theta. So I'm going to pause here for a second because it's a big deal if you can kind of look back and compare with what we did before. Notice that these, so these are a couple constants, these are a couple constants. Our variable here was x, well here our variable is theta. You can see these are the same equations except that there is the added complexity of this is the sine of the angle. Okay, This ends up being a much tougher differential equation to solve. Here it's just saying two derivatives of the position function give you the position function back with a negative constant in front. Here it says two derivatives of theta of t will give you the sine of that function back with a um, negative constant in front. Um, that's much tougher to solve. Um, so partly be for that reason, um, it, the physicists will, will tend to make what's called the small angle approximation. In other words, wouldn't it be nice if this sine theta, if it weren't sine theta, if it were just theta, because then we'd have the exact equation that we have here. Um, and so what we are going to do is make that approximation, and we'll say that if theta is small, I'll put that in quotes, okay, then what will happen is sine theta is pretty much just theta, right? Now you can check that out if you just pull out a calculator and play around in radians. Uh, I may make another side little video about that. Um, my students are often pretty triggered by this because this is like, I thought phys physics dealt with the truth and you're lying now. Um, what we're going to do is just make an, uh, an approximation called the small angle approximation. And you get d squared theta by dt squared equals minus g over l theta. If you just roll with me on that, we can come, come back to uh, this thing later. Um, let's just see what happens if we if we go for it with this. Well, if this is the case, if you can actually stomach this for the time being, we can cheat off of our previous work and then just write down the solutions. This says there's a function out there. If I take its derivative twice, I get it back with a negative constant in front. Well, we already did that with the mass on the spring, right? So we can kind of cheat off the work we did before and say, well, instead of it being x of t, it's theta of t. It's going to be some kind of an amplitude times cosine of, well, instead of root k over m, now it's going to be root g over l times t plus a phase. Okay, so that will be the solution to the, um, for the angle as a function of time. You can get the angular velocity by taking one derivative and the angular acceleration by taking two derivatives. Um, you'll see if you take two derivatives of this function, it will actually work in here. Um, the next thing we can do to cheat off of our previous work is, you notice we had a period as 2 pi root m over k. Well, we have the exact same equation, but with different critters, different constants. And so we can just cheat off of our previous answer and see that we get 2 pi root. Now, instead of it being uh, m over k, it's going to be l over g in this case. Right, so now you notice the period is 2 pi root L over G. To tie back with what we did before, another skull and crossbones here. Um, it obviously depends on the length and on how strong gravity is. But again, there is no dependence on the amplitude. Amplitude. And then to, sh to look back at what we did before here, or the mass. Notice the mass doesn't show up at all in, in, the, um, in the equations of motion for the, for the pendulum. If you increase the mass, you would have more torque from um, uh, the, you know, because of the increased weight, but then you'd also have a greater moment of inertia. And so those effects kind of compete and it comes out in the wash. So it ends up not influencing then the motion, okay? Uh, as far as the small angle approximation goes, um, one way to see um, why we could maybe get away with this is if you've had enough math to know about um, to know about uh, Taylor series, um, sine theta you can write as as an infinite series that goes like um, theta minus theta cubed over three factorial plus theta to the fifth over five factorial. And so if you 
neglect, if theta is really small, let's say, then theta cubed will be super tiny and theta to the fifth will be really tiny. Um, you're, what you're basically doing is neglecting these like higher order terms and so you're just kind of cherry picking out this, um, this first term. Um, another way to see it is simply make a graph of the sine function. So here's a sine theta, let's say against theta. Um, the sine function, of course, looks, looks like this. All we're saying is that if you cherry pick and kind of go for like small angles here, if you don't let the angle get too big, what it's saying is that sine theta is pretty much just theta or it approaches a line. Um, and so for, for the, as long as you kind of stay within this regime, um, this early part of the graph, um, what we're doing is we're saying sine theta equals theta as, as long as the angle's small. Obviously, the, the, it gets terrible as the angle gets big. You can see the line deviating from the sine graph quite a bit. Um, so that's what's called the small angle approximation, and that is how a pendulum moves.